Uh, before I actually start the program, I do want to promote our next month brown bag. Uh, that will be uh, called Butchers and Healers, Medicine in the 19th Century. That'll be Tuesday the 21st at 12 p.m. Uh, that'll be by Kevin Moore, who is the Associate Curator of Artifacts from the Hayes Presidential Library Museum. Um, so he's going to be going over basically 1800s medicine and all the terrible stuff that that entailed and you'll go, wow, I'm glad I live in the 21st century and don't have to deal with any of this. Um, and hopefully, if they're willing, we'll record that program. So if you can't make it to the actual showing of the or the actual presentation, you'll be able to watch it online. So, like I said, slowly going to try and enter the 21st century here. Awesome. So, welcome to our program, Killers on Kelly's, 1911 triple murder on Kelly's Island. Uh, my name is Jeremy Angstad. I'm the museum services manager here at the library. Um, I'm in charge of scheduling a majority of the history programs, as well as I'm in charge of running the Follett House Museum for the library as well. So I get to do lots of fun history stuff for us. Um, and I found this topic in a book by an author who came to speak uh, a couple months ago. Uh, his name is David Myers. He's actually going to be our February brown bag speaker. And David Myers wrote a book about the Black Hand, kind of a early spin-off, early well, an early representation kind of the mob. Basically, they ran protection rackets uh, all across the U.S., mostly New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio were their main areas. Um, and in that book, he talked about many different people, and one of the people who was. Uh, who's, a, who's involved in this triple murder that we'll see was part of the Black Hand. Um, so he mentioned at the end of the book that this person was involved in the murder, and I started doing a little research, and I thought, oh, it'd be kind of a neat little blog post for us, and it turned into this program. So it's quite fascinating. I hope you guys find it as fascinating as I do. Uh, so as many of you probably know, uh, Kelly's Island, the biggest thing they were, or the biggest business on Kelly's Island in 1911 was the Kelly's Island Lime and Transport Company. So basically they ran a large quarry out there. Uh, there's still remnants of the quarry around. It doesn't operate anymore. I believe they closed operation, I wanna say 80s? I'd have to, oh, so, someone's shaking their head. Do you remember when? It closed down for a while and then it reopened. And so it's probably been about several years since it's been closed. Okay, so it closed and reopened, all right. And then the barge over there in Marblehead bought it, but they didn't want it to operate. Okay. See, that, that's why I like having locals in my program. I've only been in the area for two years, so this is how I learn things. So that, the, so thank you. Um, so, but in 1911, it was very busy. Um, and most of the workers for the companies were immigrants. Um, a lot of Italians, a lot of Hungarians uh, ran, were part of it. Um, and most of the workers, of course, had lived on the island. It's very expensive to have to take a ferry back and forth to the island every day. It was even, you know, for workers who are getting paid very little to do this hard work, there's no way they could have done that. So they're going to live on the island pretty much all week. Uh, maybe take the ferry into town for part of the weekend, but they would spend all, most of their time on the island. So let's jump into the actual murder. So on Saturday, September 23rd, 1911, a body is found on the north side of Kelly's Island. Uh, it's washed, uh, well, mostly washed up. A couple of workers see it kind of floating just offshore. They wait till it gets close enough. They wade out and bring the body up onto the island. Um, the body is tied up. It's stripped. There's no clothing on it. And the body is horribly stabbed. It several, stabbed a couple of places and his, the thro uh, throat cut almost all the way back to the spine. Um, so the person is horribly mutilated. They like to, they talk a lot about that. Um, so that's how we have nice detail what happened. Uh, the body is taken to the store of William Berger. Uh, William Berger was the undertaker for Kelly's Island. 
So it was taken, of course, to the Kelly's Island, um, to the undertake spot. The next day, the body was officially identified as Tonio Dakari. Um, so the ones to figure out who Antonio is, they are able to figure out where he lives. They go to his house and they find out none of his roommates are in the house or on the island. No one knows where they are. Um, there's blood stains all over the house. Uh, so no one actually knows what happened. And at this point in time, they figure they'll never know what's going to happen. Um, at the beginning of the organization or the investigation, they um, they figure they'll never find the murderers. Uh, they figure they long since fled. Um, the coroner comes out to look at the body, and guess what? They figured out, hey, his throat was cut and he died. Wow, that was. I'm glad he came out to identify that, since we, you know, it's pretty self-evident. Uh, but he also said that the person was dead before he th was thrown into the lake. So one of the original theories was he, uh, this person was murdered on a boat and then thrown overboard. Uh, but after the coroner's inquiry, they figure his roommates did it on the island and just threw him into the water. Um, so that's the 23rd. They do the coroner's report. On September 28th, two more bodies wash up on the island. Uh, they are identified as two of Antonio's roommates, uh, Jan and Pirelli Burrell. And I am going to apologize. I'm going to butcher all of these names. Um, I've never taken any Italian, and I'm awful at it, so I apologize in advance. Um, so once they figure out that, you know, three of the roommates are dead, they figure the two that are missing are probably the murderers. Um, once they have eliminated three, they give the sheriff a description of the other two uh, roommates, and the sheriff starts his pursuit of the suspected murderers. And what he does and how he finds them is actually really fascinating. Um, so he follows, he's able to track them to Pittsburgh. And the way he does that is really interesting. So he finds, he goes to the Port Clinton Railroad Station, uh, talks to one of the men there the, uh, who works on the state, on the platform. And he tells them that two men uh, matching that person's, uh, those two people's description got on to the train. And he also knows that he was able, he remembered they put two trunks on the train and he remembers that they were marked to go to Cleveland. So the sheriff follows the luggage. He's able to trace the luggage to Cleveland. And from there, he's able to trace it to Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, the sheriff still continues his pursuit for these two guys. Um, he starts looking around, uh, thinks he figures out where they are, and at that point in time, he starts working with the Pittsburgh Police Department. Uh, in the police department, he works with um, a particular detective, uh, Detective Angelou. Uh, detective Angelou is really interesting. He was one of the very early undercover Italian cops for the Pittsburgh Police Department, and he actually worked in other cities because he spoke Italian, he was Italian, he could blend in with these organizations. Um, so and uh, he works with Angelou and they track uh, the suspects to a house where three other people are also staying. Um, and they basically do a raid in the middle of the night. They go in at 1 a.m. into this house to arrest all the people in the house. They station people around. Uh, a couple of people try and jump out the back window. They arrest them as well. Um, and they brought along the timekeeper from Kelly's Island Limestone Company, the Adolph Kurtz that you, have, you can see up there on the PowerPoint. Uh, he was in charge of, you know, paying everyone, punching everyone's time clock, and he recognized these two men. So they brought him along so that they could have a positive identification. So once they're arrested, they find the two trunks. Uh, once they open the trunks, they find articles of clothing, some of it blood splattered, they find a pistol, and they find $600. Uh, they lock it all up, and they figure that's going to be important for the trial. The next problem is they have to get them from Pittsburgh back here to Sandusky because, you know, they have to bring them back for trial. 
and they bring out the prosecuting attorney from Erie County out to Harrisburg to go talk to the governor and they get the proper paperwork filled out, it takes a couple days. Um, and finally, they are able to bring all of them back here to Sandusky. And a kind of interesting side note, one of the, city, one of the county commissioners goes as a, a deputy sheriff to help bring them back. It's never explained why one of the county commissioners goes out to do it. Um, it just seems like he wanted to and got to. Um, and they brought them back and they brought them back on October 5th to where we're all sitting today, the Erie County Jail. As most of you probably know, this was the original Erie County Jail up until the 70s. Um, we are, which makes this story to me all the much more interesting because we're in the room where they may have been kept at one point in time. Um, and a lot of this story does revolve, or they were kept in this building. So to me, I think that really adds something to the story that goes with it. So the investigation continues. Um, uh, the sheriff and the prosecutor, um, Hart, go out back out to Kelly's Island uh, to look for more evidence, talk to witnesses. Uh, they find some more buddy, uh, bloody clothing stashed under one of the houses. Um, and they decide that it's time to uh, convene a grand jury. So on October 19th, uh, Prosecutor Hart puts together a grand jury to try and bring charges against um, Viscaro and Clawlich. Um While the grand jury is going on, they, exu they exhume the two brothers, Prelly brothers, from their graves to look for more evidence. So they do that uh, October 17th. Now, if you remember, they found the bodies on September 28th, and they were in the water for about five days before that. So for about three weeks, these guys have already been dead, and they had to dig them up and put them on a ferry and bring them back over here to Sandusky, actually to the basement of the building we're in. And the reason why was to try and locate a pistol ball or pistol bullet that would have been in them to use for the trial. Um, while this is happening, a couple days later, on October 19th, they finally, uh, the grand jury uh, brings back three, convic uh, three verdicts of guilty for them, so they will proceed to trial. Uh, Viscaro and Klawich are brought before the judge, uh, Judge Stahl, to, of course, the courthouse right across the street from us here. Sorry, right across the street from us here, that way. I always could turn around this room. There's no windows. I don't remember where anything is. Um, they both plead not guilty, and they have one defense attorney assigned to both of them. His name is uh, George Ritter, a uh, local defense attorney. Um, so originally, they uh, were going to start somewhere around, I always get the date wrong, uh, November 20th, 22nd, 21st. Uh, 20th. So uh, November 20th, they originally wanted to start the trial, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, their attorney Ritter was recovering from a uh, infection of mumps, and he was still sick. Um, so they couldn't start the trial until the 22nd. Interestingly enough, um, on the evening of November 21st, a group of Italians show up outside the jail here. So literally right outside the street here on what's Adam Street. And they demand to see the two Italians who have been arrested for these charges. And the sheriff says no, and they say, we're not leaving until we see them. And the sheriff says, no, you can't do that. It's against the law. And luckily the crowd disperses without anything else happening. But kind of an interesting side note, one of which that was a big enough happening that it a decent sized newspaper article written about it that they took note. So finally, uh, November 22nd, they start jury selection. <sighs> jury selection is a pain for them. Um, so on November 22nd, they start going through names. Uh, the first day of jury selection, they go through, uh, do I have, here we go. Uh, they went through 60 names for the jury. Um, on the 23rd, the 
Sandusky Star Journal, which is the paper that's here, wrote a really interesting article. Um, it won't, if, uh, sorry, uh, if you won't send a man to electric chair on circumstantial evidence or have an opinion as to whether there really was a murder committed at Kelly's Island last September, or if you are opposed to capital punishment or prejudice against laborers of foreign birth, you cannot sit on the jury in the Clawwich murder case in which the effort to select 12 men was continued Thursday. So that kind of gives you all the things that the two lawyers are looking at and why it's such a problem for them to fill the jury. So like I said, November 22nd, they start picking the jury. It's not till November 27th that they finally have all the names or all the jurors selected. They went through 139 people before they finally filled the jury. It uh, took them a long time to find enough people who were not prejudiced and were agreeable to the death penalty because the county was seeking the death penalty and people who had to find an opinion. And one of the bigger problems was um, people who weren't prejudiced against immigrants. Um, and you kind of get a really interesting mix on the jury. Um, you get uh, insurance uh, insurance salesman, you get a hardware merchant, a government employee, a couple farmers, uh, someone who worked at the Iron and, St Iron and Steel Company, and one person whose uh, profession was retired. So a nice little mix. So finally, on November 28th, uh, they have their opening statements, and this is where I want to kind of put a disclaimer uh, in where I hit kind of a roadblock in my research. Um, so I went all over, made all sorts of phone calls, but the one thing that's missing from all of this is there are no transcripts surviving of any of the trials. So as we go through this, there will be four different trials we'll talk of. Of the four different trials, um, only one short transcript survives, but that doesn't help us with most of the evidence. Um, and everyone I talk to has no idea why none of the transcripts survive. Um, three of the trials happen next door, right over at the Erie County Courthouse. That's where the transcript should be. I have, over there, I found subpoenas for all the witnesses. I found nice big books that list all the jurors that they interviewed. Um, I found some other documents we'll talk about. I don't want to give away yet because it'll kind of ruin our story here a little bit. Um, I talked to the Ohio Supreme Court where one of the cases ends up. They have, you know, record that the case happened, but they only have a very short transcript of the arguments in front of the court case, but they were also sent original transcripts from the other trials. They don't have those either. Um, so... It really was, I would say, a setback to this. Uh, luckily, we had two newspapers in town at the time. We had the Sandusky Register and the Sandusky Star Journal. Kind of a side note, if you ever go to the Sandusky Register building and you look at the top, you'll see there in stone, you'll see SJ. It stands for Star Journal. So the Sandusky Register bought the Star Journal and then moved into the Star Journal building, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so all the information I have about what happened in the trials, a majority of it comes from the two newspapers. Um, I looked at over 225 newspaper articles to put this together. So I have kind of an idea of what happened, but we'll never know exactly what was said in those courtrooms because unfortunately those records are gone. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there as a disclaimer as we move forward. Um, so it's on November 28th, we start our opening remarks uh, by Hart and Ritter, um, and then the trial begins. On the first day, Sheriff Ritter testifies about the evidence they found on the island. Uh, the coroner comes out and testifies about um, the murder. Now, what's kind of interesting to me is they only brought one charge of murder for the case for the first victim, Antonio Dakari. Uh, they never, uh, the other two murders, two brothers, were never prosecuted. Their cases were, we'll find out, resolved, but they were never brought 
the their murders were never brought to trial. And I've never, I couldn't find a good explanation as to why they only brought them up on one charge of murder, maybe because it was easier, maybe because they thought it would be faster. It's never really explained, but they only bring them up on one charge of murder. And they try each man separately. So according to Ohio state law at the time, each man has his own trial. So the first trial is Clawwich. Um, so for the next couple days, they start going through uh, different witnesses. Um, so Adolf Kurtz, uh, we already talked about, he was the timekeeper of Kelly's Island who basically identified um, Clawwich and talked about their arrest out in Pittsburgh. Um, Joe no uh, Nowak, he was the, a, let me just make sure I have that one right. Um, um, he was uh, one of the, was a kid who crawled under the house that found some of the bloody clothing. Uh, Dr. Griffith was, uh, just testified about the nature of the wounds. Um, Henry Critch, uh, Kirchman was one of the railroad operators who saw the men in Port Clinton. Uh, James Yule uh, was on the ferry when the two men escaped town. Um, and then Detective Peter Angelou, he was the detective from Pittsburgh that I talked about, who was relatively famous and very helpful. Uh, Dr. Spencer of Cleveland, he was the most interesting witness to me. Um, he was their kind of scientific expert. So one of the claims of all the red that was found in and around the house that all these men lived in was that it was red paint. So they found this Dr. Spencer from Cleveland who could come out and basically prove that, no, this is actually blood, it's not paint. So I thought that was really fascinating that they were able to bring in a specialist witness from Cleveland to do that. Um, Sheriff Rudder is called to the stand again um, to identify the trunks and things that were in them. Uh, we go over his pursuit and the arrest. And then finally on December 6th, the prosecution decides to rest their case. Uh, the defense doesn't call any witnesses of their own. They cross-examined all the witnesses the prosecution called, but they decided not to call any witnesses. Uh, Clawwich um, didn't, uh, didn't want to testify at all. Um, so Ritter started his closing arguments on December 6th. Uh, he started losing his voice, so they resumed them on December 7th. Um, then Hart, the prosecutor, also finished his uh, closing remarks on December 7th. Uh, jury is given very, um, given very implicit instructions about what different crimes the person could actually be found of. Let's see if I have one of those. Um, so they said, that besides finding out guilt or innocence, um, they could be found, mur uh, find him guilty of murder in the first degree, murder in the second degree, manslaughter, assault, uh, assault and battery, and uh, murder in commission of a robbery. So he spells out that these are all things they could find him of. So the jury finds him guilty of murder in the second degree, and they make a recommendation for mercy. Now, they didn't do this very quickly. It took them basically a whole day. Uh, they marched down to the, so they originally started their deliberations, and they uh, walked the jury down to the West Hotel for dinner, kind of in a double file line, almost like you would do with elementary school kids, just to kind of keep them, make sure they didn't act with other people. They walked down to the West Hotel, which is where the county building is today. It was a very large hotel. Brought them back. It wasn't until very early the next morning that they found them guilty. But they also had a recommendation for mercy. So what the recommendation for mercy meant is the judge didn't have to sentence him to the death penalty, just life in prison. So he was sentenced to life in prison. Uh, the jury count was 11 to 1. Only one person decide, uh, stood their ground and decided there should be mercy. 
the or the defense attorney Ritter uh, appeals for a new trial. His reason for a appeal is relatively, I don't know, low, but he says that one of the jurors had served on a jur jury earlier in the year, so he shouldn't have been allowed to serve again, um, which was kind of interesting. So we'll come back to his appeal a little bit later. So after the first trial ends, uh, they go right into the second one till Savaggio. Um, they were able to finish his jury selection relatively quickly. So they've started on the 12th. Um, they only had to go through 12 jurymen before they were able to uh, fill their jury. Once again, kind of an interesting mix. Uh, someone who's retired, several farmers, a painter, um, someone who were, a fisherman who worked on the, on the uh, lake. So kind of an interesting group uh, mix again. And I don't want to go through the trial the exact the same way. It was basically the same as the previous trial, same witnesses, uh, with kind of two big differences from the prosecution side. Um, the first one is they have another foreigner who there's no name for this person. The newspaper just say another foreigner from Kelly's Island. Uh, once again, something we're missing from all the transcripts is we don't have this person's name. Um, basically, he just, they testified that the people in the house next to them were loud and fighting all the time. Uh, the other person who testified was uh, the mayor of Kelly's Island, James Hamilton. Um, so what Hamilton testified for was that Savaggio sent a $100 money order uh, shortly before he left the island to Italy. On December 19th, the prosecution finally rests their case. So the same day the prosecution rests, um, so, uh, Savaggio takes a stand to testify. And one thing I didn't mention before, because this is kind of more interesting time to mention, is both the defendants, uh, neither of them speak any English. They only speak Italian. Um, so for the first case, they hired an interpreter, um, uh, Ruggiero Rosselli, well, for both cases, and he, his job was basically to interpret everything in the courtroom for the defendants. But at this point in time, his job is to interpret what the defendant is saying. Um, Savaggio says he has no idea what happened to his roommates, how they ended up dead, how they ended up in the lake. Um, he says he left the island because uh, he was getting, um, having problems with arthritis and the climate wasn't good for him, so he wanted to go back to the warmer climate of Italy. Um, he's questioned about why the clothing in his trunks is uh, too large for him. He says that he bought it for his father-in-law, who's back, to, back in Italy, who was going to take it with him. Um, finally, on the December 22nd, both sides give their closing arguments, um, and the case is turned over to the jury. The jury doesn't take that long. They just take a few hours, and they decide on guilty with no recommendation of mercy. So finally, on January 4th, uh, Judge Stahl sentences Savaggio to death. Um, and at this point in time in history, the death sentence is carried out in the electric chair. Um, so that is his sentence. Um, so as we talked about already, um, Ritter appealed for Qualich on December 27th. Um, and it isn't until April 4th that that case is... Um, uh, sorry, in my case, backward. On April 4th, Ritter appeals to the circuit court for to overturn Savaggio's conviction or grant him a stay of execution so that they can argue the case in front of the Ohio Supreme Court because it is a death penalty case. Um, kind of in the middle of all of this, because it's kind of, I find it kind of interesting, is Ritter submits his bill to the county for about, I'm trying to remember, it's about, uh, about twelve hundred dollars, fourteen hundred dollars, and the co the county says, "Oh no, you you don't get paid that much," and they paid him four hundred dollars for defending these two men. Um, 
there's a whole, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, there's a whole issue of money that's the background to all of this uh, from the county side. Um, so on April 12th, the circuit court makes their ruling for Savaggio's case. They say that they're not going to overturn the conviction. They don't see anything wrong with what happened. But that being said, they will grant a stay of execution so Ritter can argue in front of the Supreme Court to try and get the conviction overturned there. Three days later, on April 15th, uh, the circuit court um, has a discussion about Qualich's case. And they bring Qualich in for this, and they basically give him an option. They said, basically, look, you were saved from the electric chair by one vote. Do you really want to have another trial knowing that there's a good chance that you will be sentenced to death. And he decided yes. Now, kind of in the background of that, the Hart was talking with the county commissioners and they were actually debating about bringing the other two charges of murder against Clawwich as well because they weren't happy. They wanted the death penalty for him. And they were kind of set on trying to make sure that he got it. So we start the whole trial process again. Um, so on May 23rd, they start jury selection again. Um, and they finally finish it on the 21st. Uh, once again, a huge number of jurors. They went through 200 jurors to fill the, fill the jury. Uh, during this, on May 27th, they talk about the county's finances. And they said that the county may have to take out a loan to be able to pay for the murder trials. Because remember, they have to pay the prosecutor. The prosecutor has an assistant as well, special for these trials. They have to pay the defense attorney, Ritter. They have to pay the cost for all the jury per day as well. They get a flat fee. Um, and also tied in with this, and this will tie in with Hart's re-election campaign, which we won't talk about because it's kind of boring. Um, earlier in the year, earlier in uh, 1911, we're now 1912, um, early in 1911, Hart lost a murder case that cost the county a lot of money. So there was a lot of, I don't want to say approbation, but a lot, uh, there was wondering if it was worth worth the money to basically prosecute foreigners because they killed other foreigners. And if it just would have been, yeah, they killed each other, we don't really care. Um, so, of course, they didn't do that, but that was kind of one of the discussions that comes out in the newspapers. Um, the trials, once again, very similar to the first case. Um, Three big differences. They bring in a couple more neighbors of Clawwich to talk about some of the fights between them. Um, Roselli, who was the interpreter, gets to testify this time. And his quotes are pretty, pretty interesting. So um, on December 22nd, during the first trial, Savaggio, uh, Roselli was in the jail here and he overheard a couple of conversations couple different times. So on December 22nd, um, Savaggio tells Krawitz that he was telling too much and that if, uh, he, if he, talk, he shouldn't talk, try and save himself. Savaggio said, if we keep quiet and, and are killed, there will be some doubt about it. But if we tell, tell, them, we, uh, tell them about it, we will be killed. Um, another time in January, Savaggio told, uh, said he had fooled the judge and he told Krawitz to keep his tongue. Um, and the other accusation was Ritter said that Rosselli, who we just talked about, the first translator from the first two trials, hadn't been translating properly and has been misrepresenting what the two men had been saying. Um, there's a whole fight in the newspaper between uh, Rosselli and the new interpreter, and they actually bring back... Uh, Detective Angelou from Pittsburgh to do to check over some of the interpretations to make sure <clears throat> to make sure that they've actually been interpreting what these men have been saying right. Um, and what Detective Angelou came to the conclusion of, Rosselli may not have been translating word for word 
exactly, but he had been translating properly from Italian to English to make sure that it actually made sense in English. Um, so now those were the only real, real arguments. Uh, June 17th, both sides finally give their closing arguments. Uh, this time, they, the jury finds very quickly, they find him guilty with no recommendation for mercy. So that means he's going to be sentenced to death. So, just two days later, Fawich finally confesses to the crime. Uh, he summons his lawyer to make a full confession. Um, so just to kind of give you a brief account, because uh, we don't have a word for word uh, one. Uh, so he says that uh, him and uh, Savaggio lured Jim Borelli into a potato field to go steal potatoes for the house. And while they were there, they killed him. Uh, they went back to the house and got his brother and lured him out, telling him he needed help. Um, when they got him out to the potato field, the other brother realized what was going to happen. They had a fight and they killed him. Um, then finally they went back to the house where Antonio was sleeping and they killed him in the sleep. They had been planning it for about a month. And the reason they did it was because they knew Antonio Vascaro was <coughs> saving up money to go back to Italy and he had a large amount. So they did it basically to steal his money. And they killed all three because they figured there would be less witnesses. They decided to put the bodies into the lake just to try and hide their crime a little better. But if you're going to dump the body, wouldn't you dump it on the south side of the island that it might not wash back up on the island? At least if it's that side, maybe it'll go to Port Clinton. <laughs> um, didn't think it through real well, I guess. Um, so after his confession, he decides not to appeal again. Um, July 2nd, he's officially sentenced to a death penalty. So you might be thinking, why did he confess? The reason for the confession was at that time period, sometimes, not always, but sometimes if they confessed, they would be granted a stay of execution from the governor. Um, now, We'll talk about why that didn't work here in a minute, but that was his reasoning behind it. Um, so originally, they're first granted a stay of execution in August till October 22nd. Uh, the reason that's, uh, that stay is put in is uh, because Ohio was going to have a constitutional convention and a vote and one of the uh, amendments to the Ohio Constitution that was going to be voted on was the elimination of the death penalty. Um, it, the elimination of death penalty was one of eight amendments that were not added to the Ohio Constitution. There were 22 that were put up. Uh, eight failed. Uh, temperance was another one that failed. Uh, giving women the right to vote also failed. Uh, eliminating the word white from voting rights in Ohio also failed, even though it didn't matter because there were, you know, federal laws that superseded it. Uh, just kind of an interesting election. Uh, while this is going on, uh, Ritter uh, alerts the Italian consul in Cincinnati to try and help these two men. And then also at this point in time, this one Ritter um, decides to did I lose the slide? I lost the slide in here. Uh, to drop Clawwich as a um, as a client, or both of them as a client. So one of the slides I missed, and I didn't even notice it, um, was that Savaggio gets a hearing in front of the Supreme Court. Um, once again, represented by Ritter, and they make their arguments in front of the Supreme Court in June, early June. And while the Supreme Court is deliberating if they're going to overturn the conviction, that's when Clawwich decides to confess. And you wouldn't be surprised that when the Supreme Court hears of the confession, they decide not to overturn the conviction, the Ohio Supreme Court. Um, 
So after the Supreme Court trial, Ritter also the uh, Lee Savaggio um, as a client as well. The Italian consul tries to set up a meeting with the Ohio governor, Governor Harmon. Um, they're granted a second stay of execution until November 15th so that the Italian consul can meet with uh, Governor Harmon in early November. The Italian council does meet with the, the Ohio governor, but he decides not to grant any stays of execution. Um, one of the th interesting things I found out when I was reading this was <clears throat> the governor during his terms never granted any stays of execution. Uh, he was of the opinion that the, uh, that the judges who and the juries who made their decisions they made the right decisions and he wasn't going to interfere with the justice that they had meted out. Um, so I find it kind of interesting that he just didn't mess with the courts at all during their, um, during his time. So uh, Klawich is finally executed on November 15th. Savaggio is executed on November 22nd. Um, they're the first two men from Erie County to be sent to the electric chair. Um, not probably the first that they ever wanted, but the one that they unfortunately got. Um, I don't know if any other men from Erie County were ever sent to the electric chair or not. I didn't really dig into it um, all that much, but I know that these two were the first. And kind of one of the interesting things I did find over at the courthouse was this is the physical death warrant uh, for one of the men. I don't remember which one um, anymore, but they both had one like this. Um, and if you see kind of the writing at the bottom, um, those talk about the stays of execution that they were granted, and then finally the date that they were finally uh, executed on. Do you guys have any questions? I, I came in late, so what year was this? 1911 is when the original crimes were, the, the original murders were committed in September of 1911, and then the executions were carried out in um, November of 1912, so relatively quickly uh, by by today's standards. But back then, you know, kind of slow. Uh, part of the reason is uh, somewhere in the beginning of the 20th century, so the early 1900s, the state uh, took over executions for the counties. Uh, originally, early earlier in Ohio history, the counties actually performed their own executions when they did hangings. Um, I was talking to the sheriff, and is it the courthouse down in Norwalk? I believe they still, it's not assembled, but they still have like all the pieces of their gallows in the basement of the courthouse. They just never got rid of it. Um, I wanna say it's the Huron County courthouse. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I know we had several executions at, in the old fairgrounds here in Erie County. Um, so, it, it, so this was kind of a different where they were, once they were both sentenced to death, they were sent to the um, uh, state prison down in Columbus. You had a question, Mary? Well, that was my question, what year they executed them, but it was the following year in 1912. Yep, that's right. Yes. Rosario. Roselli ran the Roselli's grocery store behind that book building, which is going to be torn down now. Oh, okay. For many years, I worked there when he, oh. was, he was still living, and this was in the four, late 40s. Oh, okay. So he was an older man. So he probably was probably relatively young when he was... Uh, when, during this was yeah, happening. He was an interpreter. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Um, if you guys have any other questions that you didn't want recorded, I'm going to turn the camera off and I hope you all enjoy your evening.